Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> Welcome to Concord Hospital Trust What's Up Doc series. My name is Tia Teriak and I'm a trust associate and executive assistant to Pamela Puleo. The trust is very proud to bring you our What's Up Doc series designed to update you with information regarding the latest in treatment, services, and technology provided by the exceptional physicians and healthcare providers of the Concord Hospital family. I'm pleased to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Marianne Petricelli, MD. Dr. Petricelli is a radiologist at Concord Imaging Center and X-ray Professional Association, and she specializes in breast, orthopedic and abdominal radiology. Dr. Petricelli earned her bachelor's degree in geography and biology at Middlebury College before attending medical school at the University of Vermont. Dr. Petricelli comes to Concord Hospital after completing residency and fellowship training at Yale New Haven Hospital and Yale School of Medicine. Dr. Petricelli has expertise in all areas of radiology, most particularly in breast and orthopedic imaging, as well as minimally invasive and image guiding procedures. Dr. Petricelli has been increasing her participation in healthcare advocacy, particularly in spreading awareness about breast cancer. And as you can see, October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and the uh, trust staff has pinked up today's event uh, to recognize that. So please join me in welcome welcoming Dr. Mary Ann Petricelli. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, I am going to be talking today ultimately about some new software packages that we are now using and hoping to roll out in the next several weeks um, at Concord Imaging Center when patients come for their mammogram appointments. Um, but first, given that it is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, I just wanted to start with an overview about how breast cancer affects all of us in our country and how screening mammograms can um, benefit women and reduce the mortality and risk of breast cancer. So, Breast cancer statistics in 2019, breast cancer is the most common cancer diagnosed in women. About 12 to 13% of all women, that's one in eight women, will be diagnosed with breast cancer during her lifetime. This year, more than 300,000 new breast cancer cases are anticipated, and that makes up almost a third of new cancers diagnosed in women. So this is a big issue facing us in all of our country, most people know someone who's been affected by breast cancer, and these statistics just speak to that as well. Mammogram screening guidelines have been in the news a lot in the last several years. Um, many different societies who have some sort of uh, role in healthcare for women out with different screening guidelines. All of these are based on slightly different goals, um, based on the underlying um, goals and targets of each organization. They range from aggressive screening starting at age 40, continuing annually, as is recommended by the American College of Radiology and the Society of Breast Imaging, to less stringent screening that's advocated by the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, with many other organizations kind of falling somewhere in the middle between those two kind of ends of the guideline. Um, as a radiologist, I would recommend following the guidelines from the American College of Radiology and the Society of Breast Imaging, recommending screening mammograms beginning at age 40 and continuing really until the health of a woman is such that she would maybe not accept treatment for breast cancer or is expected to live for less than five to 10 years or so. Screening mammograms save lives. The reason we screen for breast cancer is to find it early when it's most treatable and most survivable. We wanna find small breast cancers that would have eventually developed into a bigger cancer. We wanna screen people to find them when they're small, when we can have our colleagues in surgical oncology, medical oncology, and radiation therapy 
be able to treat those cancers and cure a woman, not have her kind of in this prolonged state of having breast cancer. Breast cancer is the number one cause of death for women um, age 35 to 54. So this speaks to how it is important in younger women as well as older women. Mammography has been proven to reduce death due to breast cancer in women who are screened beginning at age 40. And 25% of all years of life lost to breast cancer. So years of life that women would have been expected to live, those lives are lost in women who are diagnosed before the age of 45. These just are some more statistics about the benefits of mammography screening. Um, cancer occurrence, one in six breast cancers occur in a woman who's younger than age 50. Um, years of life gained starting at age 40. All of the organizations who put out mammography screening guidelines don't refute that the total number of lives saved is greatest when you start breast cancer screening at age 40 and continue annually. Um, and 40% of all the years of life saved by mammography are among women in their 40s. Regular screening can cut death due to breast cancer by approximately one third um, in women ages 40 and older. And the greatest mortality reduction from breast cancer comes by starting breast cancer screening with mammography at age 40. Early detection is important, and this is what I was saying earlier. We can find early stage breast cancers, so these zero, stage zero, one, and two breast cancers. So that's breast cancer that is essentially still within a woman's breast, not spread to lymph nodes, or just a few lymph nodes right in the same area. We give that woman greater than a 90% chance of surviving five years after her cancer diagnosis. That drops off a little bit as you get to 10 years, but it's still quite high. And for women with stage zero and stage one disease, the treatment advances in medical, surgical, and radiation oncology have progressed to the point that we are curing women of these breast cancers if we find them early. That's another reason that we advocate for frequent breast cancer screening annually. I wanna give you a kind of brief pictorial history of mammography so you can see where we've come from and where we are today. This is a mammogram of a woman's breast, or it's an x-ray of a woman's breast from 1934. So this was obtained with the x-ray equipment available in that day. There was no specific considerations made for imaging breast tissue. It was the same kind of x-ray that you would have had of a bone in those days. Um, you see here there's kind of a contour abnormality or a bump right here in the upper breast compared to the rest of the denser breast tissue. When they removed that woman's breast and sent it to the pathologist. This is a full field pathology gross or section of this breast tissue. And you see this cancer in the upper portion of the breast here. So this is what we kind of started with in terms of early, early breast imaging. And now I'll show you where we've come from. We moved from kind of technology in the 1960s, still didn't use compression for mammography and we're really using general x-ray equipment. We moved to screen film mammography, which was prevalent um, through the 80s, 90s, um, and that uses compression and certainly gave us a benefit compared to mammography that was performed without compression. During this time, the conventional views of mammography, the top to bottom view and the side to side view were also really formalized as the best way um, to perform mammography, and that was an adequate tool. This is the kind of mammogram that most of the clinical trials, that all of those guidelines I talked to you about at the beginning of the presentation, these are the mammograms that those results are based on. So we're looking back to the 60s, 70s, early 80s, and using that technology to but some people are using that technology to make the recommendations for how breast cancer should be screened for in women today. In the early 2000s, we moved to the full field digital mammogram. There was a big difference when people started advocating that you should get digital mammography. This is what that means. This is akin to the difference between your film camera and your digital camera. These mammograms were obtained on film, as it says, screen film mammography had to be developed um, and over time we moved towards the all digital systems. The, these systems allowed us to kind of 
as you can with a digital photo, you can enhance it, you can make it more blurry, you can make it less blurry, we could invert it so we could look at it in a flipped black and white image, and all of that increased our cancer detection rates um, between the screen film systems here and the digital systems here. We've moved even further beyond the digital mammogram today, and we've moved into 3D mammography you've probably heard about. This is called tomosynthesis, and that just means that we take kind of a arc of x-rays across a woman's breast, and we're able to take that data, and then we can look through the woman's, woman's breast kind of like different little slices. So I'm gonna play this video through, and then I can scroll through it slower so you can really see the detail in the breast. So that's the whole tomogram, and if I bring this cursor back, we can kind of slowly move through it, and you can see how much more detailed a look we get at the breast tissue as we move through this image. And so this is the current technology that we have available at Concord Imaging Center and that we've used at Concord Imaging Center since 2015. <coughs> So this here we have a, this is the 2D composite image that was obtained at the same time as the 3D tomographic image. These are the single slices that have been pulled out of the tomogram that I, like the one that I just scrolled through. Here on this one slice, we see this kind of angulated, spiculated lesion in the upper portion of the woman's breast. This is a cancer, and this is where it is in this mammogram. And that's basically hidden. There's nothing on that image that would kind of raise my suspicion that there's anything going on, um, that any malignancy in this woman's breast. But when we use the tomosynthesis mammogram and slice it apart, it becomes much more easier to see. And so that's how we've really improved cancer detection with tomosynthesis to be able to find these small, essentially curable breast cancers. Sometimes people talk, to, talk about the risks of screening mammography. One of the risks that is discussed most frequently is that of kind of the whole process of breast imaging. So I just wanted to walk you through what that looks like. And I'm gonna step back here so I can read this slide in a little more detail. So for all of these numbers that follow, we're working with a group of 1,000 women who have a screening mammogram. Out of that 1,000 women, 100 women will be asked, oops, excuse me, will be asked to return for additional imaging Usually that means extra mammogram pictures and possibly an ultrasound. Out of those 100 women that are asked to return for extra imaging, about 60 of them will be told that nothing is wrong, that we saw some overlapping breast tissue that looked different than previous years. We investigated that further with more mammogram pictures and possibly an ultrasound, and there's nothing wrong there. 20 women will be asked to come back and have another mammogram in about six months. This is a special case reserved when the radiologist thinks that there's less than 2% chance that there could be a cancer in a certain spot. And we just want to double check that area at a shorter time than our recommended year-long interval. About 20 of the women will be asked to have a minimally invasive needle biopsy. This is a procedure that's performed in our offices with local anesthesia, similar to a procedure at the dentist's office. Most people report that it's a little bit painful when we put the numbing medicine in, but that overall, typically, the biopsy procedures are um, not all that painful for women. It's a pretty short procedure and accomplished uh, easily by our breast imaging uh, physicians. And five of those women will be diagnosed with breast cancer. So five out of every thousand women that we screen end up with a breast cancer diagnosis. In order to get there, we ask 60 people to come back and have extra mammogram pictures. 20 people are asked to have a biopsy. Those are the risks that are put out to the public as the risks of screening mammography. So, you have a risk of needing to have a biopsy procedure versus the risk of developing cancer in between your 
spread out mammograms of, le of more than a year. I don't know, all in all, I think I'd rather not have an advanced breast cancer, but that those are the decisions that are being put to women and their physicians to make at this point. And because of that, like I just said, we're moving towards this era of personalized medicine where women and their physicians are being asked to take all of this information that we can present to them and move forward and develop a personalized breast screening plan for each patient. All of the screening guidelines pretty much discuss that they are meant for average risk women. And it's important for a woman to know, are they average risk? And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we determine that because that plays back into some of the software that we're now offering at Concord Imaging Center. So there are a lot of risk factors for breast cancer. Being a woman, <laughs> age, family history, genetics, personal history of breast cancer, prior chest radiation if you had something like lymphoma as a child. Um, a high-risk lesion is a benign biopsy finding that gives you a higher chance of eventually developing cancer. Usually that means that they saw some atypical cells, cells that aren't 100% normal, but they haven't actually become a cancer yet. Race is a risk factor for breast cancer. Obesity, pregnancy history, breastfeeding history, menstrual history, which means how old you were when a woman started having their period and when they went through menopause. Use of hormone therapy at any point in life. Drinking alcohol, lack of exercise, smoking, and breast density. The risks that get talked about the most tend to be family history and a genetic predisposition for having breast cancer. But 75% of women who are diagnosed with breast cancer don't have a family history of breast cancer. So if that's the main focus of people's risk assessment, you're really leaving out a big portion of the people who may have an elevated risk of breast cancer. So, Researchers have come up with risk calculators for breast cancer that take all of that list and kind of try to figure out how those play together to develop an actual estimate of a patient's breast cancer risk. And all of these calculators look at risks slightly differently. Some of them assess for risk to advocate for genetic testing for a patient. Some talk about MRI screening or the use of prophylactic medications of breast cancer, medicines that could kind of prevent a breast cancer from forming. And a lot of them have online tools, but they're often cumbersome and take a lot of time for doctors in a primary care office to use with each woman who comes in for a physical. Um, another risk factor that I really wanted to highlight and that we're gonna talk about in some more detail this morning is breast density. This has gotten a lot of news coverage in many states recently and I'm just going to walk you through what breast density is and why it's important to us in mammography and how it plays back into this risk assessment and then personalized breast screening. So a woman, a mammogram picture is made up of white and black pixels. Typically the blacker the area is, the more fat tissue there is. And the whiter the area is, the more glandular breast tissue there is in that region. So. Mammographers divide these categories up into four categories. We would call this breast almost entirely fat. We would call this breast, breast scattered breast tissue. We would call this one heterogeneously dense, and we would call this one extremely dense. And about most people fall somewhere in the B and C category, but put together, 40% of women over age 40 fall into category C and category D. Most women don't know their breast density. You can only find out what your breast density is by having a mammogram. As I said, you can only find out your breast density by having a mammogram. Breast cancer is four to six times more likely in a woman with extremely dense breasts than it is in a woman with fatty breasts. That's because cancers tend to form in that glandular breast tissue because cancers are, for the most part, cancers of that glandular tissue. Mammograms are also less sensitive in patients with dense breasts. And breast density is actually a stronger risk factor for breast cancer than having a mother or sister with breast cancer. Oh. So this is an important risk that many women don't know about. 
excuse me. Yeah. Um, density is determined by the glandular tissue instead of the fat tissue. Exactly. So if we go back to this picture, <coughs> the white part of a mammogram image, that's glandular tissue. The black part, the, or the darker gray part, that's the fatty tissue in a woman's breast. So everyone has some combination of glandular tissue and fatty tissue making up their breast. It's just the proportion that changes from person to person. And it's not something that your doctor can know by feeling your breasts in a physical exam, and it's not something you even know from living in your body for however long. It's really something that you can only find out by having a mammogram. Um, just to show you, this is a mammogram of a relatively fatty breast, and this is a small cancer that's pretty easy to see. If that popped up as new from the year before, that would really stand out to us as radiologists, and we would be able to say, hey, that woman needs to come back, and we need to look at that area closer. This is a much bigger cancer, but in a woman with extremely dense breasts, and because that glandular tissue is white and the cancer is white, we don't see it as well. You could easily pass that over as just part of her t glandular tissue. Um, this again is one of my tomosynthesis images, so I'm going to play this through. I'll tell you that this area here, this white patch of tissue, is a normal patch of fibroglandular tissue that has been present in this woman's breast for many years. When I take the tomosynthesis and scroll through slowly, there's a cancer hidden in that patch of tissue that's new from the year before. And there it is, right here, that, those little spiculated margins. That's a new breast cancer that really you would not see without the 3D mammogram. Tell her whether she has A or D? Yes. And so and that's what would be an important question to know. Hold your question because yeah. other people have thought the same thing. Yeah, yeah, okay. So this is just my summary slide of all of this. So as we increase our breast density, the sensitivity of mammography decreases at the same time that a patient's cancer risk is increasing. So that's really a conundrum that we as mammographers and breast imagers need to be aware of and know so that we can give proper screening and adequate screening to every woman. Just like you said, people thought it was important for women to know this. So starting in 2009, there's been a real push to notify women of their breast density in the letters that women are required to receive um, with their mammogram results. So this started in Connecticut and has spread pretty much across the country. 37 states have some kind of breast density notification law on their books. Um, in New Hampshire, a bill regarding this was introduced in the 2016 legislative session, but it was not passed. Um, they did expand coverage of mammography services to include tomosynthesis, the 3D mammogram, but they didn't mandate uh, breast density notification. Does Concord Hospital do it anyway? Yeah, good That's what we're getting to. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did not. Earlier this year, Congress passed a law telling the Food and Drug Administration to develop breast cancer reporting language. The Food and Drug Administration oversees the accreditation and the um, rules for mammography equipment and for centers that perform mammography. So then the Food and Drug Administration pr proposed updates to that rule book that would include breast density notification nationwide. So there wouldn't be a difference between what a woman would know if they got their mammogram in Vermont or Connecticut versus what they would know if they got their mammogram in New Hampshire. And all of this is being done because we do have new tools that let us screen <coughs> dense breasts better. We can perform screening ultrasound examinations, which is using sound waves to look at the breast tissue. 
And by ultrasound, the dense breast tissue still looks white, but the cancer looks black. And it makes it much more obvious looking at a small cancer by ultrasound in the dense breast than it does on mammogram. So screening ultrasound is one tool, and then screening MRI is really our gold standard for finding small breast cancers. But MRIs take a long time, they're expensive, and we have to use contrast for an MRI for breast cancer, and there's risks associated with giving people contrast. So we're not gonna be able to do MRIs for everybody right now. Um, so those are really targeted at patients who have an estimated lifetime risk of greater than 20%, have had prior radiation to their chest, or have high risk um, pathology lesions seen at a time of another biopsy. So what are we doing in Concord? This all gets back to the title of my presentation, which discusses new software packages that we have available at Concord Imaging Center and the Breast Care Center. One software package, and this is not the most important part for you, but this is, these are the two software packages that we have put into place. One is called Volpera, and that gives us a measurement of a patient's breast density based on their 3D mammogram data. And that helps decrease the differences that if your mammogram is read one year by me and read another year by one of my colleagues, we might see your similar pictures, but say your breast density was two different things. Because it's just based on what our eyes perceive and where our thresholds are for those four categories. So we're hoping that this decreases that variability that women could see. And then it also gives us some automated quality control systems I'm not gonna talk about that in much detail, but that hopefully will standardize our mammography pictures better and help our technologists improve um, in the quality of our mammograms over time. And then also we've implemented a new tool called Aspen Breast, which are, is our breast uh, imaging management and reporting system. This is where we create all of our reports, but more importantly, every time a woman comes for a mammogram, our technologists take a lot of history information from each woman. We ask you your birth date, your weight, your height, how, who's had breast cancer in your family, who's had other cancers in your family, have you had a hysterectomy? All of this information has always been put into a system that we as radiologists could see, and we'd scroll through it a little bit, but it, like you saw with all of those different breast cancer risk factors, it's not something that's easy to put together to really know a patient's risk of breast cancer. And so Aspen Breast has a package that gives us a much more detailed risk assessment. And I'm gonna walk through a little bit of what that looks like here. So this is what Volterra does. It's a computer-driven breast density measurement based on the 3D data from the mammogram. And it has excellent calibration to MRI measurements of breast density, which are really the gold standard. And it gives us a picture that gets put into every woman's um, mammogram images and gets saved that says what Volpera thought their breast density was. The radiologist, it's at our discretion to change what actually gets reported. Typically, we tend to move people up levels. Um, and if we have certain scenarios where we know Volpera doesn't work very well, so it's always left up to the radiologist's discretion what the actual reported breast density is. But the breast density that goes into the risk assessment model is an actual number that comes from Volpera. Aspen Breast, like I said, is our tracking and reporting software. Our technologists are gonna be asking even more history questions of women as they come for their mammograms now. That'll decrease in subsequent years as we've collected some of that data. But we're always gonna ask for any updates, particularly to family history and personal history going forward so that we can have the most accurate information. Going back to all these risk factors, it, we're seeing the data from these risk assessments come across with mammograms, and quite frankly, it's been surprising to me who's higher risk and who's lower risk based on what the software calculates. It's really not something that you can tell just from looking at a list of risk factors. And so this is what the Aspen software spits out. These are all those different risk models that I talked to you about in the beginning. 
there's only there's several built into the Aspen system. We're focused on these tire CUSAC risk models. Those are have been validated to be accurate, and those take into consideration the breast density of each patient at the time of that mammogram. Um, and those are validated for recommending screening MRI, which ultimately is our underlying goal of targeting screening appropriately to each woman. And this is basically what it spits out. It spits out a risk assessment in addition to those pictures that we would see as a radiologist reading your study. And we can include a sentence about the risk assessment information in this letter that goes to the patient. <clears throat> Ultimately, all of this is trying to move us towards better informed decision making for women, giving women the information that they need to make a decision about when and how to have breast cancer screening performed, and helping them have the information to take to their doctors so that they can have that conversation with their primary doctors. So we're working on this with the Breast Care Center, and we're very excited about moving forward with the software so that we can give what we think is the best uh, breast cancer screening possible to the women in this area. Questions? When will the software be implemented? We're still working with some of our colleagues across the health system to come up with exactly when it'll be implemented. We want to make sure that particularly all the primary care doctors have all the information they need to have these kind of nuanced conversations with women. Once we get that taken care of, hopefully in the next few weeks, we'll go live with it. Yep. Who actually sends out the letter whether your um, breasts are normal or not? Does your primary care physician, after they receive the results of the mammogram, or does the, the letter come from the... Um, the letter comes from radiology. From radiology. And will the density measurement be included in that in coming yes, times? Yes, it will. <coughs> we still, like I said, we're working with our colleagues, particularly in primary care, to make sure that um, we have a good path for patients once that happens so that no one kind of falls through the cracks, basically. And if you go back to risk factors, uh, obviously the first four, five, you cannot control. Yep. Um, actually, further down the road than that. Yeah. What can be controlled that would reduce your risk of breast cancer. Obviously, you can stop smoking, but, um, and when you say drinking alcohol, how much are you talking about? Uh, using hormone therapy, how many years? Um, those, yeah. those are all really good questions, and that's why this is so hard, is there's no cutoff that this is okay, this is not okay. These are all just the risk factors that we know play some role in contributing to breast cancer risk. Honestly, most of these down here, it, aside from the breast density, which I kind of left at the bottom because many of these are more expected, those are some of the lesser risk factors, but they do still play some role. A lot of it you can't control, like you said. Uh, breastfeeding history, you mean, did you feed or not feed? So overall, if you if you breastfeed, you decrease your risk of breast cancer. Any percentages? I don't have the percentages on the top of my head, no. And it depends how long you breastfeed. All of this gets to your overall exposure to estrogen in your body over your lifetime. And so that's why it's hard to model this. It's hard to predict this. Um, so if you started your period earlier, You've, your body has been exposed to higher level estrogen of estrogen longer. If you go through menopause later, your body has been exposed to estrogen longer. If you breastfeed, that kind of knocks down your estrogen production. And so the longer you've breastfed, the lower your risk of breast cancer is, but it's all tied back to overall estrogen exposure for your body. Can you say a few words about breast cancer in men? So, only about 1% of, of men get breast cancer. It's not 
something that we see very often. Men don't get screened for breast cancer because it's so rare. So typically men who get breast cancer um, present because they've noticed a change in their breast. Mm -hmm. Is there something, um, as a woman, we go in and you know, we have our yearly checkup with our primary care or ob is there something we should, they just generally, oh, we'll get your mammogram. Should we be having a discussion about what type of mammogram we would like with our primary <coughs> care or the referral source before we come to talk to imaging? Is there something that we should be looking you know, to have the referral state or is it just a, when you come in, you'll, you, you assess what's the best test for each person? In terms of mammograms, mammogram is a screening test for everybody. Even if someone is recommended to have supplemental screening, we call it supplemental because we mean in addition to a mammogram. So. A mammogram is for everybody. There's not a better test than a mammogram because there are certain signs of cancer that don't even show up on an ultrasound or an MRI. Even though I called MRI the gold standard, we still need that mammogram. Um, I would recommend that every, every woman get a 3D mammogram. There are still places that are only doing the digital mammograms that don't give you that 3D picture like I was able to scroll through. Everyone who gets a mammogram at Concord Imaging Center gets 3D mammograms. There's no one in this area, in our health system, not doing 3D mammograms, but there are other facilities in the area that don't do 3D. So that would be my recommendation. That's more if you call to make an appointment. If you call somewhere else other than Concord Imaging Center, I would recommend that you ask, do you do 3D tomosynthesis mammography? Yep. I think I heard you say that we're behind in legislation, and of course politics is so quiet in Concord. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it seems to me like we should, no, I'm joking, of course. Yeah. Uh, uh, it seems to me like uh, a good takeaway from this group ought to be, can we find a person who will be in touch with the all-female Concord delegation to the New Hampshire House, and would people be available to instruct them and to help them <coughs> fashion a bill? that could uh, do a lot of good for a lot of people? I think because that I have somebody in mind, it's not okay. me. <laughs> <laughs> you no, know, you know, it's, a, it's a, a person recently retired from here mm -hmm. and who probably would uh, could be uh, quite convinced that this is worthy of her time and, uh, and that of the other folks as well. Uh, so I'm just saying, maybe we should take this one step further. What's happening here is great. And, and we're all glad of it, and you can spread the word. But it's a very quiet word. We need to have a big thing that's written, and it says House Bill such and such or Senate Bill such and such. Yep, I think that that's a great point. The good thing to know is that even in the absence of that, nationwide this is coming up to the forefront, that there's gonna be a national standard very soon, it seems, that will require the breast density notification. And I'm not, I'm remembering that I'm not entirely sure that it was clear in my presentation, but part of all of this is that Concord Imaging Center is starting the breast density notification, even without, even <coughs> before the nationwide standard goes into place. This is something that we feel really strongly about as radiologists, that women deserve to have this information. Yep. Um, I'm a retired general surgeon. Mm -hmm. The density information is always on, has always been on the film. That, that is inherent in the mammogram. I think the risk information is an important question because we certainly don't want people over-reading a woman with a higher risk more. Yeah. But I think that's where the supplemental screening comes into play is that if we know that a woman is having 
dedicated supplemental screening because we know she's high risk and has dense breasts, we have that backup of either the ultrasound or the MRI that's gonna give us a better look inside that dense breast tissue for her. So I think that's really where we're hoping to head is that people really buy into the supplemental screening that we feel is necessary for those higher risk women, especially if they have dense breasts. Mm -hmm. Does Concord Hospital keep track of, I know your service area is quite large, but of incidents of breast cancer over a period of time and just getting the different, you know, are certain communities affected more so than other communities and kind of a socioeconomic tracking as well within your service area? I'm gonna look back to Larissa who's in the back <laughs> because she is, that may be out of your, she's, my, she's my data guru and she's gonna turn as pink as the tablecloth. I am. But um, <laughs> she's in charge of all of our data, basically. And she knows more how we break that out and how frequently. And really if you wait question. for them to become that palpable, you, that you have to ask those people who want to start at 50, what do we do with this? It's, it's hard to put the genie back in the bottle. Mm -hmm. And if anything, we might be screening earlier in the future. Uh, you know, the that one is that. And that's exactly the point of why I showed you how the mammograms have changed over time. Yeah. We're decreasing radiation dose and increasing our ability to pick up these small cancers that we can cure. And we want to be able to do that for women in the community. We don't want them to come in because they have a big three centimeter tumor in their breast. We want to find it when it's that pea-sized tumor that a surgeon can just go in and take out and it doesn't cause problems for a woman for years on down the road or potentially death. Mm -hmm. I am looking at your risk factors. Um, are there any informational or um, statistics on exposure to radon? We're in a state with a lot of snow. Radon comes into the home through the water. Um, well, particularly well water. Um, are there any statistics on that? I think there's anecdotal data, but I don't know specific data for breast cancer in and of itself. I think the state keeps larger data sets about that tend to be more about cancer in general, 
but I don't know that they tie it back to a specific cause. Ultimately, it's really hard to put a finger on a cause of any kind of cancer. We talk about risk factors because we don't know what ultimately causes someone to get a cancer for the most part. Mm -hmm. Is there, um, when you get to be older, is there a time when you can say, I don't need when I have a low risk factor? So it's not necessarily always about risk factors at that point. That's one of the most important discussions that a woman can have with the, her primary doctor is when don't I need a mammogram anymore? And a lot of that has to do with what you'd be willing to accept for treatment of a cancer if you found one. And so if someone found a tiny small cancer that could be taken out surgically, maybe you'd have some pill to take that didn't really make you feel <coughs> awful like chemotherapy traditionally can, would that be something that you would want to have done? If it is, then I would recommend continuing your mammograms. If that's not something that you'd be willing to accept, then you might be okay to stop. Typically people talk about um, estimating that you would have five to 10 years left in your life before you would talk about stopping mammography. But there are people who you could put that mark at at <coughs> 65, and there are people who you might not even put that label on at 95 to 100. That's why the guidelines, the most open-ended of the guidelines don't give a specific age for stopping screening mammograms because it really needs to be an individualized choice between a woman and her doctor. Mm -hmm. What's the percentage of women over 80 that get breast cancer? So breast cancer increases over time, but then we do see a drop off in the diagnoses of breast cancer at later ages, but presumably that's hard to measure because some women do stop getting screening mammograms as they age. Um, so I don't have an overall percentage for you, but it does start to go down at some point, but it's not necessarily because your risk goes down. Age is one of the biggest risk factors for breast cancer. <coughs> well, and that's why it's important for you to have as much information as possible because it is really confusing and it's not something that you necessarily should just follow a guideline that was printed in a magazine or even in a scientific journal. There's a lot of personal uh, decisions that need to go into screening decisions. Mm -hmm. That's our hope for every screening mammogram. And so we do have women who come in because they felt a lump or to get extra pictures. And it's not always gonna be, it's not applied to every mammogram. And it's also, the risk models don't work in women who already had cancer. So it's not every woman who comes in who's gonna get this information and get these tests or these risk assessments run but everyone who comes in and says, I want a screening mammogram, yes. Our goal is that everyone will get this done. Do insurances typically all cover the screening mammogram or are there any issues with that? In New Hampshire, I think they all have to cover 3D mammograms. Larice is gonna nod at me if, or yell at me if I'm wrong on that. <laughs> mammograms before age 40. The American College of Radiology suggests that all women at by age 30 have some sort of conversation with their doctor about their breast cancer risk. Um, all of these 
breast cancer risk assessment tools that I've talked about have some kind of online component and are offered to patients just freely available on the internet. So I would recommend that you kind of learn your breast cancer risk. You won't know your breast density until you have a mammogram, but if there's something that if your mom or your sister have had breast cancer, we do start screening earlier. So if you know that there's breast cancer in your family or you might have an increased risk of breast cancer, we do do screening in younger women, but it's on a case-by-case -case basis. Mm -hmm. changes over time. So let me go back to so this is what we are looking at specifically. So we have a Tyre Cusack lifetime risk and a Tyre Cusack 10-year risk. Um, and people go back and forth on which one is better to be followed for subsequent recommendations, but those change over time. Breast density also changes over time. As women oh. age, your breast density tends to decrease. Um, again, because it's that the glandular tissue is the denser tissue. And as you go through menopause, typically your breast density starts to decrease. Um, so your breast, your breast cancer risk is always changing. <laughs> That's why we're gonna do this for everyone every year. <laughs> I noticed is that in my day, when you did actually biopsy someone, which in my day was the surgeon rather than the radiologist, now it's the other way around. Um, one out of two, or five. If you had five out of 19, we had basically four out of 19, about, or four out of 20, about 20% of the time we'd find a breast cancer, and the other four fifths of the time we did not. And there was a fair amount of morbidity to that because it was an incision. radiologists do this with a little needle there's a lot less morbidity and your pickup rate is actually better um, so things are getting better <coughs> from the standpoint of uh, the downside of having to have negative biopsy yep. but I never thought I'm not a woman but I'd rather have a negative biopsy having a thorough biopsy and be told it's not cancer or I have a little hole or stitches I'm not sure that's a horrible thing uh, but the US Preventive Health Task Force thinks it is a horrible thing so you have to look at their data old and it's not really representative of the whole picture. Very much agree. And the data, some of the data that they're working with is based on treatment outcomes that are not current treatments either. Mm -hmm. And so current mammograms with current treatment, we're saving people's lives with this. We've proven that mammograms save lives even with that older data. They just question how much, but with current mammograms, current treatment, it's important that we find these early. Um, a couple more things. Another risk that's often discussed when talking about um, the risks of a negative biopsy or the risks of a false positive mammogram 
is anxiety for women. And while it's certainly anxiety provoking and all women who come into the breast imaging suite at some point are nervous, especially if we've called you back because we need extra pictures or because you need to have a biopsy, we all know that that is a very nervous situation for people and you're so unsure and so like at our mercy to do the right thing for you and hopefully find a good result for you. But we talk about that for women in breast cancer, but we don't talk about that in terms of other cancers and other kinds of biopsies. Men don't talk about their anxiety about having a prostate biopsy as a negative reason not to screen them for prostate cancer. So I think that's something that we need to be mindful of as well, that while we know and are very cognizant of the fact that it is anxiety provoking, we're trying to do the right thing and find these early cancers for people. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. This is just a comment because I, um, I hear many women say, I don't want a mammogram because it's gonna get, squeeze you too hard and it hurts. And I say, as a hospice nurse, I say, well, I'll tell you, it hurts less than dying of breast cancer. <laughs> yep. And I think we would say that about our biopsies as well. Just a question, uh, step back, if you, you give me an interesting statistic. Um, I know that, uh, that women have a much higher percentage, but you said men have or 1%. Uh, uh, so if men don't get screening, and the question I have is, if they do, by the time they realize they have breast cancer, the, the breast cancer would be become much more severe, I would think. Am I correct? If they don't get screened? It can be, yes. Mm -hmm. um, the point of screening women for breast cancer is to find it early, but we also <coughs> know that one in eight women is going to get breast cancer in her lifetime. Right. If we say that's one in 100, right. then the risks of screening right. become, they, the risks kind of outweigh the benefits right. at that point. Okay. All of this is kind of a risk benefit of analysis, and at that point, you'd be screening people for all sorts of things without finding it. And we don't deny there are some negatives to yeah. the screening I was, process. I was surprised by the 1%, that's all I'm saying, yeah. really was that high. Okay. Okay, please join me in thanking Dr. We hope you will join us next month in November. Um, I, uh, Dr. Mihai will be with us and he will be discussing when wounds won't heal. And he's from a wound uh, care center. So uh, emails and everything will go out about that. Thank you for coming today. Have a terrific weekend.